Let us pray. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of all of our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dr. Brian Curley, thank you for being willing to be part of this different format for doing a sermon reflection. And I want to say first and foremost what a, a privilege it is to say to you in person, thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you. I know that I am speaking on behalf of our entire community when I say that um, our hearts are absolutely bursting with gratitude for what our essential workers are offering for us at personal risk to yourselves and even to your families. And um, you are doing so much uh, with such courage right now for the well-being of our entire community. So thank you. Thank you for that. Maybe you can just, uh, before we kind of get into some of the meat of the reflection, if you can just share a little bit with our congregation about what work you are doing when you're not here leading music at Advent Cafe. And so um, it's uh, it, my whole practice, and I guess like everyone's life, has kind of been totally turned upside down. So for those of you who are uh, fortunate enough not to know me, um, I do. Uh, I, I wear two hats. Um, I'm a family doctor. Um, I'm part of the United North Family Health Team, and so I have a family practice uh, that I've had for 30 odd years now. I'm also the medical director at Hospice Niagara, and um, both of those uh, practice settings have been tremendously challenged uh, by COVID-19. The uh, the family medicine part of my career is is totally bizarre. I, I go into the office in the morning late usually, and that's not like me. I'm not usually late, but now I'm late all the time. Um, and ninety-five uh, percent of what I do now is done on the telephone. Um, and some, and, and this is kind of interesting to me as well, uh, from a social justice perspective. Um, we are trying to do as much as we can by video chat. Um, but what I've learned is that the majority of my patients can't do video chats. Either they don't have a new enough mm. cell phone, right. they can't afford the data plan on their cell phone, or they're not privileged enough to own a Mac or an iMac or a MacBook Pro with a built-in webcam, so they don't have a webcam. Right. So, um, and, and I think they haven't struck me before this, but this is this is a social justice issue in a society where we are becoming more and more dependent on technology. There's a large segment of our population that either hasn't got access to it, doesn't have an internet connection, and can't afford the technology. And so, so most of what we're doing is being done on the phone. And I'm the kind of person that likes to, to sit down and look someone in the eye and talk to them face to face. Mm -hmm. um, body language is such a big part of, of what we do, uh, but we don't we don't get that over the telephone. Yeah. Um, what I can say though is that. When I inform my patients, almost universally, they express some concern about me, hmm. which is really uh, heartening and, and nice and kind. How are you doing, Doc? Are you okay? Are you, are you Connie's my secretary, are you and Connie staying safe? Is everything okay there? How's your day going? And and that's nice and, and, it's, and it's refreshing. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the family practice um, part of things. Um, and then the hospice is uh, because it's a congregated setting, it's not a nursing home, it's not a long-term care facility, it's not a, uh, a, a senior's residence, um, it's something different. And all of the guidelines and legislation and, and, uh, and mandates and things that have come down from Ontario Health and Public Health and the Government of Ontario say very little, if anything, about hospice settings. So we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants, trying to stay safe. Mm -hmm. um, one of the crazy things about the uh, pandemic is that anyone that comes into hospice, we want to keep hospice safe, we want to keep it COVID-19 free as long as possible. And that means anyone that comes in has to be put in strict isolation for a period of somewhere between 11 and 14 days, depending on the risk, which means that we're using full personal protective equipment 
mask, you know, right. uh, like a goggles or a face shield, gown, gloves, and you can imagine how that is. And plus, the person's family member, and they're only allowed one now because of the COVID-19 pandemic. One family member is also in full PPE, as we call it, personal right. protective equipment. So you can imagine how it is to be someone reaching the end of your life, coming to the hospice for comfort, and everybody's dressed up in full PPE. All you can see is their eyes. Thank God you can see their eyes, but you can't see anything else. Uh, facial expressions, anything like that. So care and kindness takes on a totally different aspect mm-hmm. when you're garbed up in, uh, in PPE. Um, and uh, it's tense and it's frightening at times. Um, but I got to say, Martha, um, you know, I've heard people say, you know, you're, Brian, you know, you're working on the front lines. Thank you. I'm not on the front lines. The ones that are on the front lines mm-hmm. are the ones in the intensive care unit, the emergency department, the nursing homes, the, the long term care settings. Those are the people that are really dealing with COVID 19 on a daily basis and trying to figure out how to keep themselves safe and their families safe and their patients safe and the other patients who don't yet have it. Right, safe. right. Yeah, I um, But is interesting to kind of note those levels of essential work. It's all essential work, but there's a closer proximity um, to the actual yeah, outbreak. My risk is lower than many lower others than in others. the healthcare profession, okay. particularly nurses, PSW, personal support workers, and, and you know, doctors too, yeah. that are really seeing patients who are ill and dealing with them and having to intubate them and decide to put them on put them on a ventilator or, or not. And thank God we have not gotten to the point in Ontario or indeed in Canada yet where we have to decide whether we have the one remaining ventilator and who gets it. We're not there. Yeah. Thankfully, we have not gotten there. And it doesn't look like we're going to get there, um, as has been the case in, in many other countries. Yeah, it does look like these extreme measures that we have um, taken on have helped avert have helped the worst. Except in long-term care right. facilities yeah. where there's like a second pandemic now that we're ramping up. Well, and, you know, that is very much connected to the point that you made when you were talking about that social justice issue. I mean, so much of this pandemic has laid bare those profound gaps in, in how we care for one another. Yes. Um, and we need to ask some serious questions coming out of all of this um, when we're not when we're not in the midst of just trying to respond as fast as we possibly can. Right. There need to be some serious systemic questions asked. I'm also really struck, um, you know, as you're talking about your your hospice care. Um, I've had the the privilege, really, of um, being with a number of people in hospice at the end of their lives, particularly hospice here in St. Catharines, and I know how much you and all of the staff there value your work in terms of being able to um, offer people every measure of comfort, spiritual, physical, um, emotional, uh, in those last days, and um, it seems to me that those restrictions, particularly your description of the garb, um, must be very heartbreaking for you as well. To, I'm sure that you all have ways of communicating that that care and kindness through the garb, but it must be really hard. Yes, it is, and it's difficult for our team, um, and we really very much operate as a team um, at hospice. Um, we all uh, participate in the care, um, and it's it's hard for us to. Should I say to, to be saddled with the restrictions that we have? Um, we only have one visitor per patient, and that's difficult. So uh, families are now uh, patients, I should say, I guess, and families are in some ways having to choose whether they come to hospice because if they do, they won't be able to see their several children, yeah. or mom, or brothers, or sisters. Uh, again, except through the window, yeah. which we're doing that a bit, but they can't be in the room with them. There's only one designated visitor, and only one at a time, and only one, one designated visitor per patient. Yeah, per patient. yeah. it's not the question of who gets the ventilator, but it's really hard choices. Yeah. Really hard choices, yeah. So we, uh, we just heard this gospel passage, um, this 
Easter evening walk to Emmaus. And one of the things that I've always really appreciated in this passage, and in so many of the resurrection accounts, when you really um, settle into to the accounts, um, it's not all trumpet fanfares and, uh, you know, Easter lilies. It's, there's some really, uh, some really complex emotional landscapes that are being described. And we can kind of see that with Cleopas and this other disciple who are walking along the road. We can hear the fear. We can hear the heartbreak. We can hear the loss. We can hear the confusion and uncertainty. They've lost this person that they cared about so much. I, I feel that sense of loss when they say, you know, we hoped that he was going to be the one to save us. And it feels like it's all fallen apart. Um, and, and then all of these conflicting reports about people seeing Jesus and um, all of that they're trying to process as they go along there. I take real heart in, uh, in the honesty that we get in passages like this because it tells us that as Christians, as people of faith, we don't have to pretend. We don't have to, you know, um, kind of put on a false optimism or try to mask the real feelings, the real struggles that we're having. Um, I feel like you've, you know, described quite a bit about uh, what that emotional landscape feels like for you and for your team, um, for for others in the healthcare profession right now. Um, but what do you, what what are you experiencing as those primary emotions, you know, in your setting and in in your colleagues as well? So um, we'll go with the negative first, I guess. Yeah. So we'll do the Good Friday before we do the before we do the Easter Sunday. Um, but uh, I think that uh, anxiety um, and sort of gut-wrenching, uh, I don't want to say fear, um, but there's an element of fear in a sort of a, of a, of a controlled way. Um, risk and trying to mitigate risk is a large part of, of what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, there's always risk and we're trying to minimize it as much as possible. But that carries with it a lot of, a lot of emotion and a lot of difficult decisions and thoughts. How much risk am I willing to take? How much risk am I willing to allow my teammates to take? Um, and how does that impact on, on what I'm doing? How does that impact on my family? Yeah. Uh, I worry about my family. Again, uh, I'm not in the situation that, that some are in. I'm not working daily with patients who are COVID-19 positive. Um, in fact, tell the truth, I don't think I've seen one yet. I've tested a number of people that I thought might, and they've so far been negative, yeah. which is good. But you still think, well, what am I bringing home you know, potentially uh, to my family. And then the separation from my family, Beth and I, Beth, my wife and I, are together in our house. Uh, other than uh, video chat, we haven't seen... Yeah, you can't Catherine see Josh anybody or else. Or grandson, uh, William or Carly, or the two dogs, the pugs in Toronto. But we do, and we're doing Zoom chats and things like that. But really, like I said, it's not, it's not the same as being in the room. So there's that kind of gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching kind of... Uh, kind of um, doubt, uncertainty, uh, um, anxiety. So that's the that's kind of on the negative side. But I guess for me, the the path, the gospel passage today, it, a lot of it is about how do we see Jesus? Yeah. How do we recognize Jesus? Yes. How do we know Jesus is with us? Yes. Um, and so this kind of takes me to the positive stuff. Um, there have been a number of uh, palliative care doctors around the province of Ontario that have gotten together using web conferencing software, speaking to each other, supporting each other, mm -hmm. helping each other. Um, uh, I'm involved with a group that is trying to work on protocols for how we should act at hospice if uh, we do find out we have a case of COVID-19 yeah, in okay. hospice because it might happen. Uh, we're not at the present time knowingly admitting patients with COVID-19, but we are taking people in the hospital and isolating them. And if there wasn't a chance that they might have it, we wouldn't have to isolate them. Right, so right. at some point, we may come up with a patient. Well, how are we going to react to that? How are we going to support our staff? What protocols might we put in place? 
how do we approach people who are admitted to hospice? What uh, does everyone need to be isolated? What's the risk? How do we assess risk? What do we do based on that risk? So there's been, a, I must say, I feel a real kinship mm-hmm. and fellowship um, with uh, with uh, a group of uh, palliative care physicians um, from largely from McMaster, but not entirely. There are doctors from across Ontario that we're that we're working together with, trying to hash out some of this stuff. Tremendous support. Um, Hospice Palliative Care Ontario, HPCO, the organization, um, and from uh, from our administration and staff at the hospice, and also from our administration and staff at the Maginot Family Health Team, uh, who have uh, put a lot of technological wizardry into what we're doing now, trying to communicate with our patients, keep right. everyone up to date. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear in the community, and I get that, and I understand it. Um, trying to provide information, knowledge is power. It's the best antidote to fear. Yes. So if you ask me how I see Jesus and where I where I recognize Jesus, I recognize it in my colleagues and in my uh, my staff um, and in my coworkers and in my family and in my friends, which is one of the reasons why I'm yeah. It's, it's important for me, and, and I, before we start um, the service tonight, I thank you for uh, asking me to do it. Or thank you for doing it, and you sort of said, well, thank you. <laughs> yes, I know that. But really, I, I think uh, I needed to do something that wasn't COVID-19 related directly, even though we're spending our time here talking about COVID-19, <laughs> but I, I needed to, I needed to, to play and sing and Worship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a few things in what you've just shared that I would love to pick up on because, first of all, I'm just like really struck by the metaphor in tonight's gospel that metaphor of like, here's a couple of people walking together and this stranger joins them, and, um, and then in this act of hospitality, they recognize that it's Jesus. And I, I hear that metaphor so strongly in what you're sharing. Um, that sense of collegiality and and those those ways that we're experiencing people adapt to these realities to actually draw closer to one another and offer that kinship when we can't be physically together. And Jesus doesn't really appear until they break bread together. Yeah, and right. And celebrate together. Yeah. And then and then and then it's Jesus. Yeah, and then it's Jesus. And um, I love that phrase. We're not our hearts burning within us. Like to me, that's kind of one of those touchstones of how you know that yeah, that you you're, know. yeah, you yeah, that you know that you're in the presence of the holy, and um, and I I think the same goes for you as it goes for me. For me, one of the most important ways that I get that sense of um, my heart burning is when I, I get to participate in music. Um, and, you know, that's the other thing I'm kind of picking up on in what you're sharing is that so many of those comfort measures that we so often turn to in times of turmoil are cut off from us right now. You can't physically be with yeah. your most of your family. Um, and as people of faith, right now we can't even celebrate the breaking of the bread, right. which is how we have yeah. <laughs> tradition. That's always yeah. been our touchstone yeah. um, in in connecting with Jesus. And yet, and yet, I I hear in what you're sharing, and certainly in my experience as well, um, those ways keep emerging of how we how we know that Jesus is with us, how our souls are fed. Um, and sometimes we need to look for them, right? And sometimes they're just right upon us. Yeah. But sometimes we need to. Sometimes we need to go looking a little bit. And, uh, yeah. You know, things are dark, and uh, you know the road is long. And yeah. We're on either side. Yeah. yeah. Just as that, uh, yeah. just as that passage said, and I think so much of what we do in worship is we train our eyes to be able to see. You know, like we we kind of build those muscles. So that when when the road is dark, um, we're we're practiced in how we keep our eyes open. Um, and I'm you know I'm very much hearing 
that and what you're sharing as well. Yeah. I, um, I, it really helps to put some flesh on the bones in terms of what we're all imagining is going on in, um, you know, these real uh, critical life and death moments um, that still keep happening even though the rest of the world has uh, pressed the pause button. And um, thank you so much for, for sharing your experience, for being so honest and transparent, and um, for naming that hope in the, in the midst of all of it. Thanks for, uh, for having me and, and uh, the end of the conversation. And I guess if I had to uh, leave with a parting thought or a parting comment, it's that uh, we need to have faith. Um, we need to have faith in our daily lives and we need to have uh, faith um, in, our, in our worship lives. Um, and more than ever, we need to have faith um, in what's going on around us. Easy to, it's so easy to criticize people. Yeah. Um, and uh, we look around for targets, and you certainly see this kind of behavior. Uh, I'm not going to name names, but people will probably know what I'm referring to. Where uh, you know some in leadership positions in some countries feel that they need to lash out and criticize those around them. Thankfully, we don't have that problem in Canada. Mm-hmm. I'm encouraged and. Heartened and strengthened by the fact that uh, our leadership in all levels, uh, local, regional, provincial, and federal, are working together with our best interests at heart. I trust the people who are making decisions on our behalf. Um, I trust the Chief Medical Officer of Canada, Dr. Tan, when yeah. she says, This is what we need to do, it's not over yet. I trust the Premier of Ontario when he says we can't reopen yet. I trust the Prime Minister of Canada when he tells us how that's going to look and how we might start to do that at some point. But we have to have faith. There's a danger that we get locked into after we've, after we've done this. Uh, and I'm going to quote to Kathy Crawford Browning now, not social distancing, but physical distancing. Yeah. We want to physically be distant, but not socially Exactly. Distant, right? But unfortunately for some, it's both. But um, after we've done this for, what are we, four weeks now, six weeks? I've lost track of time. I don't, I don't. People are starting to get antsy. Mm-hmm. And then you start to think, well, this doesn't really apply to me. Well, the risk is pretty low. The curve is flattening, which I don't think it is yet, but that's what they're doing. And, you know, I'm just going to go. Can't, can't I just go and see my friend? Can't I just go and mm-hmm. do this and do that? And uh, we, we have to have faith. We have to have faith in God. Um, that it's going to be okay. We have to have faith in our leadership. Mm-hmm. That it's going to be okay. We have to trust. We have to trust each other. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, we just got to walk that road. We've got to walk that walk road. Longer. Yeah, we've got to walk that road for a while longer. And I'm convinced that we have to come to some place new at the end of all of this. You know, like all of those things that you've just named about uh, how we actually can work together. We can put aside our differences. We can. Um, you know, reach out across those traditional divides, um, we've got to hold on to that. Like, we've got to let God take us somewhere new. Emmaus is down that road. we just got to get to it. We've got to get to Emmaus. Yeah, just, <laughs> and we've got to s- break, bread. <laughs> break bread. And in the meantime, we've got to sing some more. Yes, we do. I'm going to shut my microphone off here, then I'll go back up on the stage and complain. Awesome. Thank you, Brian.